so that you can follow along. So follow along in your Bibles as I read this. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said this plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I don't know that Jesus says a harsher thing not even to the religious leaders whom he calls hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, vipers. Then he says here, get behind me, Satan. Let's take this to heart today. We, what is this book? It's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Oh, Lord, teach us from your book today. Thank you. Be seated. Last week we looked at the, what we call the Great Confession. I say we call it. That's what, that's what commentators through the years have called it. The Great Confession. Who do men say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus commended that. He, he commended Peter. We read from Matthew 16, the companion passage, where Jesus responds, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I'm going to build my church upon such a declaration of faith. After that confession, we, we told you, verse 30, remember, says he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. You've got to feel the tension here. On one hand, he asks them, who, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter blurts it out. And you would think he would have said, now go and tell everyone you see that truth. But he doesn't. In fact, he follows Peter's confession in, in both Matthew and Mark's account, strictly charging them to tell no one about him. You know, I've meditated on these passages through the years. At times in my life when, when I've not been as faithfully sharing the gospel with those I encounter as I should. And I think these fellows had to have something bottled up inside of them. They had seen the miracles of Jesus. And now when Jesus presses them what are you hearing from the crowds? Well, they think you're some kind of a ghost, really. They, Elijah or John the Baptist or one of the other prophets who's already dead. They, they think you're something of a ghost, that you've somehow come back to life. One of these characters has come back to life and you are the embodiment of them. And what about you? I told you last week we've got to be clear on that. We can't be fuzzy on who Jesus is. We cannot accept as acceptable just because someone says, well, I think he's a good man. He was a good man. But he doesn't want to be known as a good man. And so there's this, what we call this messianic secret that he keeps from the general public. 
And really and truly, as we follow the, we weave the Gospels together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he hasn't really told them at this point what he's about to tell them. And I think I can assure you when Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he, did, he was not declaring that in anticipation of a bloody trial, of unspeakable scourging and mocking, of a cross weighing down on Jesus so much that a stranger from the crowd had to be grabbed and pulled out to carry the beam. Peter spoke the truth but didn't understand the full context of what he was saying. But in these verses before us now, Jesus begins to unveil himself. He responds to a declaration, a confession, if you please. He responds to that by beginning to lift the veil and let them see what's ahead of them. Now we look back, we look back 2,000 years, we look back through biblical lenses, we know the rest of the story, and so we see things even differently now than, than these disciples saw them at the point of Peter's confession. And I want us just to introduce today something we're going to delve into next week and see from this passage two things that Jesus begins to speak of his death and resurrection. And that Jesus rebukes Peter for worldly thinking. He begins to teach them. Here's the confession. And in both Matthew and Mark, immediately after this confession, he began to teach them which meant he wasn't going to tell them just once. He was going to say it over and over. Began to teach them that the Son of Man, one of his favorite designations of himself, the Son of Man, Daniel's description as the one who was coming. The one who would come and set right all the ills and cruelties shown to the people of God, Israel. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. That was difficult to hear. It would be difficult, folks, if we had a missionary in our midst who had come to visit us and share with us about the work of God going on in one of the difficult places in the world. And then when they were getting ready to leave, said, now, I'm going back to such and such a place. And I know what awaits me there. I'll be arrested. I'll be tortured. I'll be killed. We would we would cling to that person. We would say, no, you don't, you don't have to do this. You, you can stay here. You're, you're here. You're safe. There's, you don't have to go back and face that. We, we would do that. It would be just a natural human response. And Jesus is unveiling. He's pulling back. He's telling them where he's going. And if they're going to follow him, and by the way, we'll... Soon after this, we'll get into the discipleship passages in Mark, where he'll talk about the cost of being a disciple. I think America is facing the trouble we're facing 
because it hasn't cost us anything to be a follower of Jesus. It was fashionable for several decades. It began to be less fashionable as we watched the culture go secular on us. But it hasn't cost anything. And Jesus will exhort his followers to think about the cost. Just as he tells them in this passage that it's going to cost him greatly for them to see the kingdom come that they want to see come. But look at this second part of this because this, this fascinates me. Jesus rebukes Peter for worldly thinking. Matthew tells us a little more about Peter taking Jesus aside. Look at verse 32b. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter began to rebuke the Messiah. Peter began to rebuke the Christ. Peter began to tell him that that was not the way it needed to happen. Your jaw drops when you read that. Who? Who would have the temerity? Who would have the audacity to rebuke Jesus? And what Peter doesn't understand is he's falling right into the trap of the very people that are going to take Jesus, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, who spent all their time rebuking him. See, Peter's thinking was not biblical thinking. Peter's thinking was not informed and shaped by all that he had seen Jesus do and all that he had heard Jesus teach. And brothers and sisters, I submit to you that if someone who lived with Jesus for three plus years and saw the miracles he saw and heard the teaching he heard, if he can be guilty of worldly thinking, so can we. So can we. And in both passages, in Mark and Matthew, Jesus does not rebuke Peter for trying to hold him back from his mission. He'll, he'll tell Pontius Pilate later on, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. I take it up. Any authority you imagine you have, Pilate, is derived authority. You have no authority, authority except that which is given from above. So, you see, Peter couldn't stop Jesus from his mission. But what he did do was he exposed in himself worldly wisdom. It is not coincidental that John Bunyan, in his immortal Pilgrim's Progress, has Christian, the, the main character who has a burden on his back, burden of sin, that he introduces Christian to someone named Mr. Worldly Wise Man. Mr. Worldly Wise Man. Mr. Worldly Wise Man is alive and well today and will get us to reason in what seems reasonable to us, but may not be the product of biblical thinking. We'll deal with this a little more next week, but just real quickly before we close. There's a principle in the scripture, and we, we discussed this the other day at our pastoral ministries team meeting, that you do what is right, by, and, and you get your idea of right from the scripture. You do what is right simply because it is right. Whether it feels right or not, follow me here, because if you will keep on doing what is right simply because it is right, God will bring the attending emotions to that. One of the devil's snares to believers is, do you, do you feel like it? 
Do you not feel like it? And we'll actually get believers to get caught up in a fog on issues that are clearly set forth as command or prohibition or principle or precept. He loves to do that. And I think we're going to take away several things from this passage next week, Lord willing. But one of the things is, I've got to make sure as best I can that when I say and do things, because Peter was sincere here, <laughs> that it's flowing out of, of a biblical thought process. You should know if you've been a Christian any time at all that there is logic, there is illogic, and there is biblical reasoning. Logic, if we're not careful, if then statements that are not true, drawing conclusions from facts that don't bear out the conclusion you've drawn. If we're not careful, we can go, into, go, go astray. Illogic, if we're not careful, is what many people are going to assign to the scriptures. Well, that's not logical. It's not logical that in order to be first, I've got to be last. I've got to be willing to be last, to be servant of all. It's not logical that in order to, to find my highest purpose in life, I've got to lose myself. It's not logical that a young woman in her mid-teens who had never been intimate with a man could find herself pregnant. It's not logical that God could be contained in a young girl's womb and burst forth alive at the full end of pregnancy and grow up and not sin and grow up declaring himself in various stages and ways and times to be the Son of God and the Son of Man, the Messiah, and then come to a point where he knew it was time for him to lay down his life and give himself over to those who would betray him, torture him, brutalize him, crucify him, and set him up for the public to see and that he would die. That is, it's not logical that God would, be, would, would show himself that way beginning in a woman's womb and die on a cross and rise three days later. That's not logical. You see, so you have to guard yourself against just mere human logic and guard yourself against illogic and cultivate, as Jesus teaches, biblical reasoning. Biblical reasoning. And it strikes me that that's what Jesus rebukes Peter for. Get behind me, Satan. Satan, the ultimate enemy of God. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but you're setting your mind on the things of man. Paul said, Therefore, we no longer think of people and things and circumstances after the flesh. But we think of those things, we see people spiritually. He doesn't mean we see everybody as, as, as spiritually part of God. He's, what he's saying is that my lenses, I've been given a set of lenses, gospel lenses, one of my friends calls them. And I see things spiritually, not just the way the rest of the world sees them. And that's, that's Jesus' rebuke of Peter. So here he is, one of the great revelations he's made. The most bold disciple he has. 
is rebuked strongly and then accused of man-centered thinking rather than God-centered thinking. And so I just leave you today to think, to ask yourself the honest questions, how do I think? When I face circumstances day in and day out, is my thinking influenced by scripture or by something else? The proverb writer teaches us, buy the truth and sell it not. Get for yourself wisdom and understanding. I heard a great definition this week by Steve Atterburn, difference between knowledge and wisdom, and I'll close with this. He said, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is, a, is in the fruit family. It's true. Not many people know that. A tomato is a fruit. He said, wisdom is knowing that you don't cut that tomato up and put it in a fruit salad. That's the difference. Knowledge and wisdom. So my ad admonition to myself and to you is make sure that we think biblically. Don't fall into the, into the ditch of mere human logic. Or the devil push us in the ditch as far as gospel things go of illogic. Biblical reasoning is called for when we see Jesus for who he is, where he's going, what he would have us to be and to do. Let's pray.